Uh, you said, uh, Mark, you said a couple of days ago that basically you think the U.S. is probably in a recession. What makes you say that? Are, are there a specific number of data checks that you're looking at? Well, if I look at exports, if I look at industrial production and uh, recent car sales and the slowing down of credit growth, and in particular, the dismal performance of commodities and also of equities last year. When you talk about doom and gloom for this year, 2016, I have to point out that in 2015, with the exception of people that held bitcoins, uh, the performance of all asset classes has been uh, poorer. And in the U.S. stock market, uh, the indices have held up relatively well because they are driven by, say, 20 stocks, whereas the majority of stocks is already down 20 percent or more. So I think the Fed has created an environment uh, by inflating asset prices where future returns on assets, whether it's art or bonds or right. stocks or real estate will be poor. And so, Mark, if we look into 2016, given what you've said, first of all, can the Fed afford to hike rates any more this year? And what's your outlook for stocks and bonds over the next 12 months? I think Miss Yellen will go into the financial history books for having waited with Mr. Bernanke to increase interest rates. Uh, since essentially 2010, 2011, when they should have done it, when the economy had some momentum, until right before a recession in the U.S. in December 2015. I think that will be the biggest joke and failure of monetary policies by uh, the monetary authorities in uh, recent history. So, Mark, where do you see the 10-year by the end of the year, the 10-year Treasury? And, and what do you see Gavi's doing in general? Well, when you talk about gloom and doom, this is one sector that I think offers investors some potential, 10 and 30 years Treasury bonds. Because if the economy is as weak as I think it will be, then interest rates are more likely to come down than going up. Number two, uh, your previous uh, person that was interviewed, he said uh, government bonds are a good short. Well, we have to distinguish the spread between 10 years U.S. Treasuries and 10 years German bonds is at the widest it's been in recent years. So I think if someone wanted to really do something, he should go long 10 years U.S. Treasuries and short bonds. All right. Mark, where do you see the S&P 500 come December 2016? Well, I don't know. I think it will be lower than it is today. All right. How concerned are you? So, so that's the U.S. So you're expecting some kind of a correction, I guess, in U.S. markets. What happens in I China? Believe, uh, I, lost... Sorry. Yeah. I believe the stock market in the U.S. peaked out last May on the S&P 2,134, and that will go down 20 to 40 percent from that level. Okay, interesting. What's your take on China? We, see, we saw a lot of volatility, a lot of brutality on the markets over the last three days. Is there a disconnect between the markets and the fundamentals of the economy? Well. There is a disconnect between real economic activity in the world and asset prices uh, most everywhere, where, with a few exceptions, where markets have really adjusted significantly on the downside. But in general, uh, markets' asset prices are high and economic activity in real terms is very poor. And in China, it was evident already for two years that the economy was slowing down. But the eternally optimistic fund managers that uh, essentially have to advertise their products to make money, they of course remain bullish about the Chinese economy. And 
this is something I will never understand, that people pay attention to the statistics that the Chinese government publishes when other statistics are much more reliable, say, import and export figures out of Taiwan to China, they pointed out to a meaningful slowdown already for one and a half years. Commodity prices pointed out to a meaningful slowdown. So in my view, the Chinese right, economy... Mark, yes. You're not seeing a hard landing, right? I mean, a meaningful slowdown is different to a hard landing. And at this point, you think we'll get... So a lot of volatility on markets. And how much will the yuan be corrected by? I think we had a hard landing in the stock market already. And we had a hard landing in commodities. And we might have a hard landing in the economy. Uh, we have a colossal credit bubble in China. And how it will unwind, uh, we don't know. It may happen through significant weakness in the RMB, although it's not sure. It could also happen through significant uh, weakness in the economy. And some sectors of the economy in China, like steel production, they already have experienced hard landing. And my sense, I would rather be overly cautious on China than overly optimistic. Uh, Mark, we've also seen, like today, we've seen, you know, the spread between the offshore and the onshore yuan widened by so much. At what point does it become problematic for Chinese leaders? Well, it may not be that problematic because they could essentially let the yuan float down. Uh, whether that would help the economy much is very debatable, because in the case of Japan, it hasn't helped at all. In the case of Europe, it hasn't really helped. So these currency devaluations uh, have relatively minor impact on real economic activity. But this is an option China has. They could also print money. They can buy assets. They can support the stock market. Uh, central banks and governments can manipulate markets uh, essentially almost endlessly until the final collapse occurs. But whether the collapse occurs through the currency or through asset prices or a credit implosion is uh, not very clear at this point. Right. But let's take a step back. So you're pessimistic or you're very cautious on China. Uh, I would say pessimistic. Mark, you say that the U.S. is in a recession. Is there a bright spot in 2016? Or should we actually worry a lot more than we are at the moment? I think that investors overlook the fact that we have been in a colossal uh, asset inflation period since 1981, when government bond yields in the U.S., the 10 years peaked out at close to 16 percent. And since then, bonds have rallied, stocks have rallied, real estate has rallied globally. And we had an explosion of credit in the world. And uh, we have had a decelerating real economic activity, decelerating productivity growth. And so we have this asset bubble. And I think that the next thing that will happen is that all the asset markets, like the Titanic, will crash. <laughs> and it won't matter very much whether you own a Picasso or the S&P. It's all going to go down. <laughs> And OK, I, I have to say, when, when you actually, I mean, you're pretty jovial for someone who's predicting a huge correction on the markets. Uh, Mark, are we talking a 20 percent correction? I mean, when you talk about the Titanic, it, it, you're almost suggesting that, you know, it could fall by half. Could be. But many markets in dollar terms have already declined by 50 percent. And currencies have been very weak against the U.S. dollar. Now, this year, 2016, Everybody's bullish about the U.S. dollar, but I don't see any reason why the U.S. dollar should be very strong. Maybe someone can argue, well, it's in a better position than other countries, but other countries have now valuations that are more reasonable. Say, if you put a gun on my head and say, you have to choose, you can buy emerging markets that have underperformed the U.S. since 2011 or the U.S., and the time horizon is 10 years, then I would say I would buy emerging markets. 
I happen to think it's too early, but I would rather be for the next 10 years in emerging markets than in the US. I would also own some gold and gold shares. This is the asset class that is very, very depressed and where I could see a doubling of prices easily with a limited downside risk. All right. Uh, Mark, on that note, I'm afraid we're running out of time, but I could talk to you for the whole day, so you'll have to come back um, with a very spirited yes. conversation uh, there from so. Thailand. That was, yeah, me too. Mark Faber, the author of the Gloom, Boom and Doom Report. Thank you so much for joining us.